Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Leah Carson Centre for Law, Medicare Legal Issues in Bulk Billing Seminar. As we begin today, in the spirit of reconciliation, Leah Carson Centre for Law acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples today. Our seminar this afternoon will be presented by Dr. Margaret Foe. Uh, Dr. Foe is a health system lawyer, registered nurse, academic, as well as the founder and CEO of Synapse Medical, which is a leading med tech company with three offices in three countries, offering digital health financing solutions to global markets, including India and the Middle East. Um, Dr. Foe has worked in health systems around the world for almost four decades, she also has a PhD on Medicare claiming and non-compliance. Uh, you can find further information on Dr. Foe's profile in the materials that you've been emailed to your registered email address this morning. Uh, if you have any questions um, throughout the seminar, um, please feel free to type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, Dr. Foe may have some time at the end of her session um, to address some questions. Um, for now, I'll pass it over to Dr. Foe. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you to the Leo Cousin Centre for Law for inviting me to present this webinar and welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see so many of my legal colleagues interested in this um, very niche area of Medicare law. Um, so look, I'll dive right in. So um, in front of you there is what we are going to cover today. I'm not going to read that slide out to you. Um, you can have a look at that yourself. I also have another slide at the end uh, because I wanted to end on a note of optimism uh, and just look at possibilities for reform, a reform agenda and, and what some of the remedies might be to make our wonderful Medicare system perhaps renewed and modernised um, and able to take us into the next generation. Um, but there are some things that um, I'm not going to talk about today, and I think it's just important to go through them, um, mainly because we won't have time for no other reason. I'm happy to touch on them if we have time at the end, but some of you may have come to this um, webinar um, thinking that I was going to touch on some areas that we won't cover today. This is going to be very focused just on one thing, which is bulk billing. And bulk billing um, is deceptively tricky. It is a, a decidedly difficult little transaction. So um, I promise you can get a full hour of me talking just about one transaction. Specifically, though, we're not going to talk about public hospitals, bulk billing uh, in public hospital outpatient departments. I will touch on it in one part of the presentation, but we're not going down that rabbit hole. Um, there's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down with Medicare, so we're also not going to talk about provider numbers, record keeping. I'm not going to talk about the PSR, so the Medicare policing system, um, and uh, the shifting bell curve that some of you, I'm sure, are aware of. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about the private health insurers, which are layered across the bulk billing transaction in the no-gap schemes. We're, we're not going to talk about that. As you can see, there's plenty more webinars that we could do. Um, I'm also not going to talk about recent media coverage of Medicare. So let's continue then. And I'm just going to start with a bit of contextual um, information, not a lot, um, but just to give you a little bit of background and context um, come, that came from my PhD. And just um, for, for you to be aware, why did I do a PhD on this anyway? What led me to it? Well, I guess um, I had been working in the health system since I was a very young woman, um, a, a nurse, um, and then I became a lawyer and then I ended up administering the Medicare scheme and I didn't understand it. That was why I went to do a PhD. I was administering the Australian health system and I did not for the life of me. I could not work out how it worked. Um, and everywhere I went to try and find the answers, because it seemed to me the answers were very important because this was public money that we were spending with every click of the mouse. So it seemed to me that it was very important that there was a very tight regulatory framework around what we did and I couldn't find it. And everywhere I went to try and get answers, I couldn't get answers. 
Um, so that's really the journey that I went on to, um, to doing a PhD on this topic. So um, my PhD took me back through time as all PhDs do. So a very quick skip through Medicare's history. We had a very successful referendum on the 28th of September, 1946, which was the social services referendum. Um, after that referendum, as you would expect, we got a new clause inserted into the Australian Constitution, which is section 5123A, and I'll come to that again in a moment. Um, jump forward to 1975, and it was Gough Whitlam who introduced the first iteration of Medicare. It was called Medibank, and it commenced on the 1st of July, 1975. And uh, Gough Whitlam, as you all know, was a very fine constitutional lawyer. So he knew exactly what he was up against in building this scheme from a legal and regulatory framework. So he used not one, but two sections of the constitution to construct Australia's first universal health coverage scheme. The first was section 96, which enabled the federal government to provide um, conditional grants to the states to run public hospitals. And then he used the new section 5123A to subsidise, not fully pay for, subsidise the costs incurred by private patients on a fee-for-service basis. A tumultuous political period followed where Medibank was abolished um, for a period of about two and a half years. It was morphed or rebranded and morphed into Medicare, the Medicare brand, uh, which commenced on the 1st of February 1984 under Bob Hawke. Now, um, it seemed like, you know, that yeah, that's pretty clear, you know, nothing new there. But in fact, it's actually really important that we start to shift the narrative about how we talk about Medicare out there in, um, in the discourse. Because you often hear people saying, well, I didn't think that was Medicare. I thought that was a state hospital responsibility, so it's not Medicare. Those two things are Medicare. Medicare is a brand name for Australia's universal health coverage system, and that system provides two things. One is free services for public patients in public hospitals that's administered by the states through state grants. And the second thing is subsidised services on a fee-for-service basis. So I'll leave, just, I won't go on about that, but it does confuse people, and I do hear it come up um, very, very often. Quickly, Section 5123A of the Australian Constitution is there on your screen. Um, the underline words, um, that's my underlining. So um, those 11 words is a very interesting period of history, um, how those 11 words came to be in Section 5123A. Um, and the High Court has interpreted those words on numerous occasions. But essentially what it means is that the Australian federal government has no constitutional authority to control doctors' fees um, and, and to control not just fees but other aspects of their practice as well. So what this does, um, when you're talking about civil conscription, as you would know as lawyers, what we're talking about there is a legal or practical compulsion to act in a certain way. And the High Court has confirmed on, on numerous occasions that both legal and practical compulsion may offend that provision. Um, and a fun fact, um, for those of you working in this area, you would have heard a lot in the media recently about APRA, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, which administers the Health Practitioner National Law. Now, the Health Practitioner National Law, despite its name, is not a law of the Commonwealth for the same reason. It's the same clause that meant that when that was being constructed, it was constructed as a state-based scheme. So that Queensland is the lead state and the other states followed suit. So it is very important not to underestimate um, the impact of those 11 words in our constitution. They really permeate um, the entire health system. Uh, they are the cause of a lot of the challenges we are now facing today but I, we don't have time to go into it to too much detail. So let's go from there. So Medicare's enabling legislation is the Health Insurance Act 1973. Um, and that's, you know, again, even that points to something. It tells you something. It is not the Health Insurance Act of 1984 when Bob Hawke introduced it. It is the Health Insurance Act 1973. 
Um, and it is essentially Gough Whitlam's original scheme. Um, that was There was very little change made to it when it was reintroduced in 1984. So the Health Insurance Act is a law pursuant to Section 5123A of the Constitution. Section 20A of the Health Insurance Act is the bulk billing law, um, and it is the key machinery provision of the Medicare scheme. There, there's a few others, and some of the case law um, has talked about there's a handful of provisions. Section 10 is an important provision as well. But essentially, Section 20A, which we're going to have a look at now, is the key machinery provision of the um, Health Insurance Act. This is how the money moves. Um, and it is the bulk billing law. So um, I thought I would entitle this slide Everything Everywhere All at Once about the Medicare rebate. So um, a, lo a lot of answers to questions about what is the Medicare rebate? What, what is that scrap of money? Whose property is it? Is it property? Is it a shows in action? What is it? And who has rights to it? And at what point in time? And how is it transferred? So these, a lot of these questions, uh, answers to these questions are found if you just look at Section 20A, but also in a couple of cases that I'll come to shortly. So the first thing is here's Section 20A um, in front of you on your screens. So the first thing to note is that where a Medicare benefit is payable to an eligible person, that is the patient. So throughout the scheme, you'll see reference to an eligible pers person, and that is an e eligible Medicare beneficiary, which is most Australians. You know, some, um, some people who are here on certain types of visas are not eligible, but, you know, the majority of the Australian population are eligible for Medicare, all Australians, and, and a lot of visa holders as well. So it's always the patient, never in the Health Insurance Act does it say anything other, the benefit is payable to the eligible person. The next person in Section 20A is the practitioner, and that is the provider of medical services. You will note Section 5123A refers to medical and dental services, um, and the civil, that 11-word caveat, the High Court has deemed it only applies to medical and dental services. And in fact, I will just jump back for a moment. You may have seen in section 5123A, you will see pharmaceutical benefits um, higher up in the clause. Um, and that is why we can have and have had, a, well, I guess in some ways, a successful co-payment on pharmaceutical benefits for a very long time in Australia. That's because the civil conscription caveat does not apply to pharmaceutical benefits. It only applies to medical and dental benefits, and that changes everything in terms of co-payments and gaps, which we'll come to soon. So the assignment of Medicare benefits, there's two parties in that transaction. It's pretty straightforward. There's a patient and there's a practitioner, and they may enter into an agreement. They may enter into an agreement. And just now that you've uh, just refreshed your memories on section 5123A and the nature of the relationship between a doctor and a patient, if um, Gough Whitlam and Bill Hayden at the time had changed that word to must, they would almost certainly have breached the constitutional provision and would have found themselves very quickly back in the high court. So um, they may enter into an agreement. It is voluntary. It is not mandatory. Australian doctors are free to set their fees for their professional services. Where we are at the moment is that um, the federal government has made some changes that were introduced and tested, I guess, during COVID, where they made some item numbers, some services that doctors bill mandatory. They said you must bulk bill it. So we're really skating on very thin ice here, um, but uh, that's where we are right now. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. I said that in my PhD, we don't know how that's going to evolve yet. But where we are at the moment is that we have subordinate legislation inconsistent with the Principal Act. The Principal Act being the Health Insurance Act, the subordinate uh, legislation being the general medical services table where item numbers reside, if it says you must bulk bill it, those two things are inconsistent. Um, so that is where we are at the moment. 
So if I just come back here, at a transactional level, what happens in a bulk billing transaction is it's a two-step process. So step one is the first mentioned eligible person assigns his or her right. Again, it reinforces that the person that has this right is the patient, it is the consumer, it is not the doctor. The next step in the process is that the first mentioned eligible person assigns their right, and they do that by signing a form or pressing a button. They sign, assign their right to the payment to the, the practitioner. And the deal is that the practitioner accepts that assignment of benefit in full payment, in full payment of the medical expenses incurred in respect of the professional service by the first mentioned eligible person. So just hold those thoughts because I'm going to uh, drill down a little bit into in respect of. What is in respect of a professional service? Two things I or one thing I also want to show you before we go to the next slide. You'll see throughout the legislation, you'll see the word singular, service not service says. So in health systems around the world, there are really only four different ways we pay doctors. There is fee-for-service, salary, capitation, and performance-based models. Really, they're the only four ways we pay anywhere in the world. So I'm working in other countries and, you know, we've got blended models of fee-for-service and capitation. And for those uh, who don't work in this area, capitation funding is basically here's a bucket of money, here's your population, keep them healthy. That's sort of in a nutshell how capitation works. And that can be on a national level or it can be on a sort of practice level. But um, fee-for-service is what it says. It is singular service. If you're talking about services, you're no longer talking about fee-for-service. You're talking about some form of other payment model, which might be a bundled payment model or capitation. So just hold that thought as we come to the next slide. So the next slide, um, 1994 was a big year um, for Medicare. So we've been chugging along for about a decade. Uh, 1984, when Bob Hawke uh, reintroduced the scheme of Medicare, we're at 10 years in now. And we've got a big decision in the High Court as the Health Insurance Commission, as it then was, and Peveril. This is a really important decision. This is the decision that really gave us information about what is the Medicare benefit? What is that thing? And the High Court held that it was like a welfare payment, like a type of pension or any other welfare benefit. And therefore, it was always subject to the ongoing will of the parliament and it could be changed or removed at any time. Um, the other thing um, the Peveril decision um, confirmed for us is that the relationship between a doctor and a privately practising patient is a, a, a private patient is a contract and it's governed by general principles of contract law. So it's no different to hiring a plumber, an electrician, an accountant, a lawyer. It is a contract. You, they, you enter into a contractual relationship. And what the High Court said in Peveril is that uh, if the doctor charges the patient $100, it is irrelevant to the doctor that the patient can subsequently go away and get a, 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 a refund for a portion of that. It's irrelevant to the fact that this is a contract. But the bulk billing transaction is... Um, complex. So you've got three parties to that transaction. You've got a doctor, the government, and a patient. And what the High Court held is that as between the doctor and the patient, there is a contract. But as between the doctor and the government, there is no contract. As between the patient and the government, there is no contract. And so there, no, um, there is no entitlement to sue, for example, for an unpaid Medicare benefit because no right, uh, no debt accrues to the benefit of either party. So you can't sue if the High Court doesn't, you know, if Medicare doesn't pay your benefit, which is 
um, basically the, the crux of the Peveril case. He said, you've taken my benefit away, I want it back. Um, and the High Court said, no, you don't have that right. It's basically a welfare payment. So um, a lot of other things we, we discovered, therefore, about the Medicare benefit, um, which is that it's not really insurance, even though it's called health insurance and the Health Insurance Act, and that word's used all around the world. It's actually not insurance in the strict doctrinal sense because there's no contracts of insurance. In private health insurance is a contract, but public um, health financing arrangements, not really. Um, and the other thing you can see there, that's an article that I pulled from the archives of the Sydney Morning Herald in 1994. Our health minister at the time was Carmen Lawrence. She was not pleased. What also happened in 1994 is that as a, I, I haven't been able to put this perfectly together, but I've, you know, trawled through the historical records to connect dots and find out what happened when. And what happened in 1994, and it happened after the decision, is that public hospitals started bulk billing um, outpatients. Um, and you'll see Section 19.2 of the Health Insurance Act there, which is still in the Act, and it says that um, a Medicare benefit is not payable in respect of a professional service that has been rendered by or on behalf or under arrangement with Commonwealth and a state. So that's supposed to say, well, look, we're paying you those grants for that, so you can't bulk bill as well. But the legal advice at the time to, uh, it, it, was, it um, started in Victoria, was when you bulk bill, it's not in respect of a professional service that has been rendered by or on behalf or under arrangement with the Commonwealth or estate. It's pursuant to a private contract between the doctor and patient. And that endures today. So let's now go to the in respect of principle. So you saw back in section 20A, if the doctor has to accept the Medicare benefit in respect of um, the services provided. So what does in respect of mean? So Medicare is a fee-for-service scheme. Every service has to begin and end somewhere. But where is that? And unfortunately, we're in a bit of a grey zone here at the moment. Now, this case um, on the screen, um, Suman Sudden Regina, um, 2006, which was appealed in 2007, um, criminal matter, Medicare fraud. Um, and Dr. Sud was found guilty of 96 counts of criminal fraud. What she did now, um, for the, if any of you are aware of her clinical um, cases, there were multiple matters being dealt with in various courts for Dr. Sud, and there were clinical matters. Um, that are completely separate and unrelated to this case, which dealt with purely with one thing, which was the Medicare compliance issue. So this is the only area of her uh, matters that I was interested in. So what she did was um, she uh, bulk billed uh, a service. She was a GP running um, a termination of pregnancy um, clinic, so an abortion clinic, essentially. Um, and she bulk billed uh, a consultation. She bulk billed for the procedure, the termination, but at, on the same day, at the same time, she charged a separate amount for patients to have counselling. They had counselling. And on the invoices, she described that additional payment as counselling and theatre fees. Now, here's what's um, really troubling about the case. So firstly, there was no question during the case that the counselling was not provided or that it was not provided well. That was not in issue. So it was being provided. It was being provided by suitably qualified people and it was of a suitable quality. So that's not an issue. So that was um, deemed, to be, deemed to have been provided. But what they're saying is, is that counselling and the theatre fee a fee in respect of the termination of pregnancy? And interestingly, they didn't. Uh, look at the consultation. So just this termination of pregnancy. And um, it was decided that the, the counselling and counselling fee was a fee in respect of the termination of pregnancy. So the problem is there's a, there's a lot of difficulties that are, are now causing us downstream problems um, because of this decision um, is, is that Sometimes patients had counselling and decided not to go ahead with um, their termination, so they, they left and they went home. And the other thing is the fee was described as um, uh, counselling and theatre fee. 
And there was no question also that she wasn't running um, anaesthetic gases into the little operating theatre that she had there um, and that she was running a proper sterile operating theatre. But here's the issue. If she had been doing that in a hospital, if she had turned her little clinic into a facility and registered it as a hospital, there would have been no question that that was not in respect of the medical fees because even back then we were already always charging separately and still do today in hospitals. The hospital costs, so um, operating theatre costs and accommodation costs are completely separate to the medical costs. So it's a very, uh, it's a very important case for my research but also um, quite troubling in many ways. I've got this little judgment up on here or this um, uh, part of Justice Adams, who was the dissenting judge in the case, because what Judge Adams says was the acceptance of the Crown submission would, in effect, surround each item number with a penumbra of indeterminate meaning, inconsistent with the structure of the legislative scheme and unfair to the medical practitioners attempting to work within its boundaries. I do not accept that the legislature intended to place doctors in the position where a not unreasonable interpretation of the Act leads them to make a claim which ex post facto a judge or, for that matter, a jury will find to be wrong and render them liable to criminal prosecution. So let's jump to now. So where are we now in the way we interpret this very important aspect of the bulk billing transaction. Well, up there on your screen, you can see the current departmental education, and there's a link there where you can jump on and, and look at it for yourself. So it's not the hot, there's a two page flyer, and this is um, just the pertinent parts of the flyer. What you can see, this is very recent. So you can see there the Australian Government Department of Health and Aged Care. It only became the Department of Health and Aged Care after the federal election last year with the, uh, the new government. So this is very recent and very current. So basically what it says, you'll see there, under the Health Insurance Act, if a practitioner bulk bills a service, the practitioner undertakes to accept the Medicare benefit as full payment for the service. Additional charges cannot be raised. This includes, but is not limited to, consumables that might be reasonably necessary to perform the service, that bandages or dressings record keeping fees, a booking fee to be paid before each service, an annual administration or registration fee. And if you jump over where it says number four, this is where I think we're really in a, a very, very dark gray zone. It says it does not matter how the fee is described, record keeping fees, booking fees, annual administration or registration fees, or cooperative membership fees, or when it is charged annually, quarterly, before each appointment or before after an initial professional service is rendered. If the reality is that the patient is charged an extra fee, then the Medicare benefit for the bulk billed service provided is not payable. But that's where we are today. And I can add there was a case prior to Sood's case uh, involving the late Dr. Jeffrey Edelston. And it even um, in that case, Dr. Edelston charged the additional fee through a separate legal entity called Delima Proprietary Limited, and he was also found guilty. So even if the fee is charged by a separate legal entity and not the doctors themselves, makes no difference. But, you know, from a practical perspective, this is very problematic because a fee-for-service scheme means exactly what it says. And as I said, I'm, I'm building, you know, working on health systems around the world where we bundle services and we have to be very clear about what's in and what's out because people do need to organise um, their affairs in accordance with laws that should make sense. So you have to be able to know. Let me give you some examples. So I once had a GP say to me, can we charge for jars of honey? And I said, oh, okay, can I inquire why you might want to charge jars of honey? Um, and he said he was a country GP and he and his wife um, um, had bees, they were beekeepers, 
and um, they made really delicious honey. And uh, they, the patients came in and um, they liked to sell their jars of honey because it was convenient for all the local people in the local community. Um, and I said, charge away, sell your honey. It's got nothing to do with the professional service. It's not always so clear, though. I had another doctor come to me recently and say, can we charge for parking? And I said, okay, any reason why you want to charge for parking? And he said, yeah, because we've got a really good car park and there's, you know, there's no parking otherwise nearby. So we've got this really good car park and we want to charge him $20 to come and park. So where does the service begin and where does it end? Does it begin when the patient parks their car? Does it commence once they've walked into the practice and they're sitting in the waiting room? Does it only commence when they're in with the doctor? When does it end? Sometimes we have some clarity, but for the most part, we don't. And a really important point here is that when we talk about Medicare and the MBS, everyone's brains go straight to GPs. It's like they're the only people that use the MBS, like Medicare is GPs. It's not. There are about 6,000 item numbers in the Medicare schedule. GPs use, you know, most of them probably use only 10 a day. Some might use up to 20 or 30. But people like me who administer this scheme, we're working right across those whole 6,000 item numbers in a vast array of settings. So this is as important to every other medical specialist as it is to GPs. So, for example, we've got intensive care item numbers which pay for a 24-hour period. So they cut off at midnight. Okay, that gives you some clarity. But then you've got diagnostic imaging. You've got diagnostic imaging services. And if you bill two of them on the same day, there's a step-down rule. You get less money. So... If you bring the patient back on a second day, you can charge and you'll get the full amount of money. So is midnight the cutoff? It's not clear. We've also got case conferences where patients don't even have to be present. It, it is a case conference is a known clinical service where a group of clinicians get together and talk about a patient in the patient's absence. So where does that service begin and end? And then you've got things like um, asynchronous payments. If a payment, and here it says the government's saying it doesn't matter when you charge it annually, quarterly, but don't you have to link it to a service? So uh, uh, another example is a person who's um, currently have recently come to me and said, We're, we want to charge a monthly subscription fee. And the patients have to pay it or our members have to pay it for being on our platform, whether they see a doctor or not. So if you pay a monthly subscription fee and you never see a doctor, but then on in the last month you do and your bulk build, is the subscription, are all of them in respect of that one professional service? So we, we have a lot of trouble here. We also had the Canberra GP co-ops a few years ago um, where it was well known that the Canberra GPs were um, charging an annual membership fee. They even got some state government funding to continue. They've unfortunately folded now because it wasn't financially viable. But it was an open secret um, that they were getting annual subscription fees and then in return for bulk billing. And, it, and the question is then why was that not prosecuted if we are of the view that that is not legal? And I'll move on from this now, but I just want to leave you with this one thought. Prior to um, the election of the new government, um, the, uh, Anthony Albanese went to the electorate promising um, 50 urgent care clinics if they were elected which they were. So we're now going to get 50 urgent care clinics. And on my reading of the model for these 50 clinics, it said um, you're going to be given grants, the Commonwealth Government's going to give you grants to cover all of the infrastructure costs, consumables, 
you know, nursing costs, bandages, record keeping fees, et cetera, et cetera. In return, you have to bulk bill. In to my mind, that is precisely what the flyer on your screens now says we're not allowed to do. So I think that we're in a really tricky place here with the way we're, um, we're looking at bulk billing. Let me just jump now to what Medicare and patients see, because it's really helpful to look in the back end. I'm, my company's a, a software vendor. We're actually fully connected in with the Medicare system. So I have a lot of deep knowledge about data fields and what goes where and which data fields are actually transmitted and what happens at the other end. These are real Medicare claims. So this is a real patient's Medicare claims. Look at that. See how it says that the cost to the claimant was zero? Well, what if I told you that that patient paid $50 on that day? Here's another one. It says the cost to the claimant was zero. What if I told you that patient paid on that day? So what you can see is, despite the law, despite that education flyer, we are in a very grey space. Because if someone does charge an extra fee, as they did twice for this patient, it's invisible because it's on a separate FPOS machine. It's not seen. What you see here is what it should look like. Jump on your Medicare records. You might be surprised yourself. Look at your cost to claimant column. Look at all the zeros in the column and ask yourself, hang on, I pay. I pay $40 every time I go. And, of course, that means that the government can say the bulk billing rates are very high. It says zero. That's what's hitting our system. This is what it should look like. The total cost was 145.20. The benefit paid was 61.80. The net cost to the claimant was $83.40. And for any of you that are still in doubt, any sceptics, take your minds back to 2014. Our then Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, tried or unsuccessfully tried to introduce a $7 Medicare co-payment. Think about it. He would not have done that if co-payments were already legal. So let's jump now to common error number one. I see errors all day, every day. My, our clients, we have hospitals and government and, you know, a whole array of clients, but we certainly have a lot of medical specialists and allied health, all sorts of people. The most common error that I see is bulk billing and charging illegal gaps. It is, I see it, I'd say, twice a week at least. This is a, a, a direct copy of a recent email I got. People are really scratching their heads. Are you sure it's illegal, Margaret? Because everybody does it. So, you know, my responses are getting very pithy now. <laughs> it's like, yes, it's illegal and it might be fraud if you know you're doing it deliberately. Um, but what's happened over time is because it's become so commonplace, there is genuine confusion. confusion. I certainly see it. I, look, I, I, yeah, I certainly see genuine confusion. It can't be wrong, can it? My practice manager says it's right. I've had doctors say to me things like, no, Margaret, you don't understand. There's the constitutional caveat. There's this, there's this thing in the constitution that says we can charge whatever we want. So that's the part that I charge. And then in addition, that's the government part that I get. And I, you know, try to explain, no, no, that's incorrect what the constitution provides and bulk billing provides, it's an either or decision. Either charge the full amount, whatever you want, or bulk bill and accept what the government pays, but you can't do both at the same time. That, my friend, is illegal. But it's very, very common. But I thought I'd take a little sideward step now because I suspect that some of you, like me, when I commenced my PhD, I thought, why can't the patient just pay a gap? Wouldn't that be better? 
And certainly the work that I've been doing around the world, um, like in the French system, you know, you've got to pay, I think it's 20 euros every time you go and see your GP. And I thought, well, then there's the pharmaceutical benefits gap. Like why, why could this not work? And the reason is that constitutional provision. That's the problem. The problem is if Tony Abbott's co-payment had gone ahead and he said, right, you, the legal limit is $7, what's to stop a doctor charging $8? We, we can't see it. Patients don't understand it. They can charge whatever they want. So how would it work? So when I drill deep into all of this in my PhD research, I learned a lot. Um, and, and the main thing is that bulk billing, it's the main cost control mechanism in the entire Medicare scheme. It was designed to keep downward pressure on medical fees on the basis that everybody would choose and would prefer a bulk billing doctor. So if you have your, your fees, you put your fees too high, no one's going to come to you. They're going to go to a bulk billing doctor. But, of course, that was only going to work when the rebates were at a level that was you know, appropriately going to remunerate um, doctors, of which, of course, we all know it no longer does. But once this lid came off, sort of after the Sud case, we haven't had any more cases that I've found that have dealt specifically with this issue. So that's back in 2006 and seven. That's like we're 15 years out now. And once that lid was off, the only direction for gaps to go was up. And what's been happening is the cost burden's been shifting to consumers more and more through invisible gaps. And as I've said, it, like I'm out there on the ground administering this day in, day out. And I, I, I say with conviction that a lot of clinicians think there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. But what they also don't understand is the impact that they've had. Because what's happened is the government no longer needs to acquiesce to doctor demands for rebate increases because the bulk billing statistics continued till very recently to say, oh, no, 90% of patients don't pay when they go to uh, the GP or use GPs again. So therefore, it must be working. The GPs are all bulk billing, so it must be working. Now, some of the GPs and the specialists are, are billing correctly and others are bulk billing correctly, but there's a whole um, array of people that are not. And, of course, what happened is once the gaps got high enough that it could support a new market, this is what was always going to happen, and I've been expecting it to happen for a long time. So first you got people like Instant Consult. Uh, innovative, um, tech-based um, uh, provider, and look at the amount, $45. And I've looked uh, a lot at their um, business model and they're doing everything it appears um, correctly. Then there's, they've stepped outside of Medicare, apart from patients under 12 months of age, so little babies, they can bulk bill those. But um, anyone else, they're just saying it was $45. 45 bucks, and you get an online um, service. And then last week we had Woolies. Woolies is now doing telehealth consultations and access to GPs and holistic healthcare practitioners. So, and they're charging, I, I think it was $45. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I think that the Woolies, what I read last week, they're going to charge $45 as well. So that's the sweet spot at the moment because you think about it. You go to a GP and pay, say, 90 That's what my GP charges now. So you pay $90 and you get 40 back, leaving you out of pocket 50 That's if they bill correctly. Or you go to Woolies and pay $45. You don't get anything back, but you're still ahead $5. It's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. And for... For um, GPs or specialists who are billing incorrectly, so they're charging their $45 and their bulk billing, if the rebates go up, nothing will change for consumers. The GPs will get more money 
but the consumers will pay $45 because that fee's set in stone now. It's not going to come down. So what you, I'm hoping what I'm helping you understand is the essence of bulk billing and how by allowing the lid off and allowing it to break, we've really um, impacted the fundamental, the essence of how Medicare was designed to work. There's other factors at play. It's not just that. It's that the rebate was frozen, that it didn't go up, that, uh, you know, increasing the rebate in line with CPI was never going to be enough anyway. You know, there's other factors, of course, but the but really bulk billing is, you know, almost over. Now, I know some of the MDOs are on the line today, um, and I saw recently that um, one of the MDOs is saying that we're going to withdraw insurance. We're actually not going to insure practitioners. Um, so, again, trying to use... I would say, very old-fashioned institutions and approaches to uh, halt the march of progress. It'll be an interesting space to watch, but I, I suspect it won't have any impact whatsoever because Woolworths is big enough to be a self-insurer, so they'll just self-insure. So another error that um, I see commonly is this one. Um, what does this mean? So um, I've seen an education um, platform where what is being taught is that see how it says general practitioner attendances to which no other item applies what that has been in, incorrectly interpreted as meaning is that you must not just bill item 23 to be compliant you have to bill as many different items as possible in relation to the services that you provide and that equals compliance billing so bill more You'll get in trouble if you build less. Um, and that's completely incorrect. Obviously, as you know, um, the MBS, by the way, this is out straight out of the MBS book. The MBS is not an instrument of parliament. It has no legal force or effect. Um, it, it is open to legal challenge. Um, and often what's in the book is inconsistent with what's in the law, which is what I looked at in my PhD. But where it says to which no other item applies, if you put that in front of a judge, who knows how it would go, but I suspect the judge would say to which no other item applies in Group A1, and Group A1's got like eight item numbers in it, not 6,000. And basically what it's saying is you can't bill a five-minute consultation and a 20-minute consultation and a 30-minute consultation you have to choose one of them in relation to the amount of time you spent with the patient. That's a very common, very common issue that I see. And that's being perpetuated by um, education providers that, um, should, in my opinion, are um, causing a lot of problems. Another error, common error number three, I see this all the time. Um, and again, this is a direct quote from one of the hundreds of emails I get every week, month. You get one item 132, then two 133s, then it's item 116 until day 366 when you start again with another item 132. Again, totally incorrect. What I um, have often said when I used to do this sort of education for doctors, I don't do that anymore, but at, when I did, I'd say you don't get anything when you bill to Medicare. You are required to provide clinically relevant services, which are defined as being necessary for the treatment of the patient. Bill for what you do. So what I, my golden rule is, um, if it's not clinically necessary, don't do it. If you do it, you must meet all requirements of every item number you bill every time you bill it. So you don't, you know, I've had doctors say to me, she was really complex. You know, I, that took a long time. I had to spend 45 minutes with that patient. And, I, you know, I had to be very sort of, um, you know, blunt with them sometimes and say, look, Medicare's not interested in how long you spent with your patient. They're just honestly not interested. Item 132 has a number of complex requirements. The patient has to be multi-morbid. You have to prepare a management plan. There's a lot of elements to it. One of the other factors is it had to take 45 minutes with the patient, not 30 minutes with the patient, and then 15 minutes on the phone. 45 minutes with the patient plus all these other things. And, you know, the response is sometimes, I'm not, you know, I'm not billing an item 116 for that. I was there for half an hour. So, you know, again, you can see that the lack of knowledge and understanding amongst clinicians about how this scheme is designed to work 
really gets them into a lot of trouble. I know some of you on this call will have been dealing, particularly the MDOs that are on the call, um, and like you and me, I've lost count of the number of item 132, 133 letters I've been dealing with over the last six months where the doctors literally were billing item 132, then the next day item 133, then the day after that item 133. And for those of you who don't know, item 133 is to review a management plan and the item 132 is to create the management plan. So, you know, you create it on Wednesday, you can't possibly review it on Thursday because you haven't even had time to implement it yet. So obviously that's going to raise a red flag, but what you can see is these patterns of billing that everybody else does it. So and that's what my senior um, clinician told me to do, so I'm doing it too. So you see a lot of that. So for lawyers, um, a couple of tips now just on navigating um, the regulatory framework, which is really uh, pretty wild in there. I'm just going to put this up on here just to show you something. Um, you know, one day when I was deep in my PhD and was administering the Medicare scheme and new things were coming up and I'm thinking, oh, I've got to put that in my PhD, um, I stood in front of a whiteboard and I put the Australian Constitution in the middle of the whiteboard and then I just started drawing lines between all of the different legal instruments I was dealing with every day to try and guide doctors, try to do the right thing, try to make the system work. And that's what I came up with. So you've got the Health Insurance Act, you've got the MBS book, you've got MBS online, different again to the book, you've got the Department of Veterans Affairs schedule, you've got the AMA fee schedule, which is used quite a lot. In workers comp if you look where the little the doctors are over on the i think the left of the screen in their white coats they just deal with those things around them fee schedules the private health insurance fee schedules they've got their own rules and they're all different the multiple workers comp third party fee schedules anaesthetists have this thing called the rvg guide they all deal with the dva and ama and the mbs but it just, there's this web that just continues right across the health system into hospitals. I had to have the National Health Act because the um, cross-referencing provisions were in there when the immigration, the new laws were passed to enable the immigration department to check immigration records, to check that doctors and patients were both in Australia at the time services were provided. You've got rights of private practice. You've got the National Health Reform Agreement. You've got state health acts. And then you've got this other area of uh, coders, clinical coders, and these whole other sets of codes and classifications called ICD 10 AM and ACHI, which we're not going to talk about today. But it all is interconnected, all of it. And it's unbelievably complex in there. So I guess my top tips for you are Health Insurance Act and regulations. I always go there first. I actually go to the MBS online and the MBS book last because I find them the least reliable. Um, often, and I and I say that, I, I think Services Australia might be on the call too. I, I have some um, sympathy for the, the person whose job it is to keep the MBS book updated. That would be an impossible task because the law is changing so fast it's really difficult for it to flow through and keep other resources updated. So I always go first straight to the Federal Register and uh, I'm looking at um, um, all the, anything with the, do you search anything with health insurance in it? Because there's a lot of determinations. It's not just the Health Insurance Act and regulations. There's a lot of determination. So you've got the general medical services table, the pathology services table, the diagnostic imaging services table, the principal act. But then in addition to that, you've got the health insurance regulations, 2018 is the current version, a lot of important information in there. And then you need to be looking at determinations because there are a plethora of um, determinations as well. Um, and then, you, you know, there's a whole range of other resources. If you're dealing with private health insurance, then you've got to dive down into the Private Health Insurance Act and all of its related 
regulations as well. So it's quite a feast of um, regulation. So um, if your clients are in trouble and have come to you, um, obviously this is a big topic. We can't go into it now. We've only got a few minutes to go anyway. Step one, I, I have a lot of doctors come to me but they come to me and it's understandable. We do a lot of, um, you know, support them with their billing and they'll say, oh, I've got this letter from Medicare, I'm in terrible trouble. So the very first thing we say to them is call your medical defence organisation and do it now. You, you, step one, get them to contact their medical defence organisation. Sometimes you've got um, clients, so I've got a few uh, matters that I'm sort of involved in at the moment where they're no longer uh, being are supported by their medical defence organisations for a whole range of reasons. And beyond that, you really do need um, some expert advice, expert help. I saw some of the people registered for this webinar. It's fantastic. There are more and more lawyers who are doing work in this area um, who I know have run quite a lot of matters, some for the MDOs, some outside of them. Um, federal court matters predominantly, a few people that have been involved in criminal matters. Um, so it's great that we've got more lawyers involved in this area. We do need more. Um, so um, if you're a young lawyer, not sure which area to go into, health system law is very exciting. Um, and I would encourage you to think about it, particularly because it's quite techy. Um, it involves, a, you have to have deep understanding of digital health, but you will need to get some expert um, advice and, you know, it's a bit thin on the ground. So um, as I said at the beginning, um, I hope that's given you a bit of an overview of the scheme, um, the common mistakes that, um, that doctors make, um, and the difficulty of the bulk billing transaction. So think about that in the context of the, um, the discourse around increasing rebates, um, because whilst I know it's a political hot potato, I hope I've helped you to understand that definitely um, it's certainly not going to help Medicare um, and it's certainly not going to help consumers because of that very tricky transaction and where the money actually flows. But the good news is there's a lot we can do. Um, it's not all over. Um, I, I was very pragmatic in, and I looked at the evidence and what we needed to do to reform. The first thing we need to do is educate. There is an urgent and pressing need for um, all clinicians to be educated and I just stress that this is not clinical education, this is legal education, and it can't wait. Um, and I would also just like to say, for the record, I will not be involved in that. I have no interest in doing that. I'm really interested in building universal health coverage systems uh, and the legal infrastructure for them around the world. That's the really exciting work that I'm doing. So I won't be involved in that, but I would. I hope I've inspired some of you to think about getting involved in that. In my PhD, the recommendations I put in is that it needs to be in the RTO sector, in the education framework, because it needs to be independent, nationally consistent, unbiased, legally correct. Um, you can't have this cottage, cottage industry that we currently have, so we need to fix that. Obviously need to do a lot of work down in the regulations, but there are little things we could tweak right now it, we don't have to rewrite the Health Insurance Act. There are little levers that we could pull that would make a big difference. And digital reform is absolutely critical. There is no transparency. Medicare basically is like someone said to me earlier today, it's like an ATM machine where anyone can put their card in and get money out, even if the card doesn't match the machine. It's, it's really, there are no checks and balances. And so with some smart digital tools, we can fix that. And, and, and we actually don't need to change the system to test it. And one of the a, a potentially perfect pilot site to experiment with some of this would be the urgent care clinics that the, the government has promised us. Um, there's a model that I can see in my brain that could work quite nicely just to test some of these things without changing anything. You don't have to reprogram software. You don't have to do very much at all, but we could test a model. Um, so I hope that that might be inspiring for some of the government participants on the call to think about. And on that note, I'm going to stop talking. I've gone flat out now for one full hour and um, just respond to any questions. So back to you, Thomas. 
Thank you very much, Margaret. A great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come through, but I would invite anyone, um, if you do have any questions, um, please type it into the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, um, and Margaret would be happy to address those. Um, we've had a question from Richard. Um, is the case that a gap is a concept that proper, properly applies to private health insurance? Okay, this is a great question, um, Richard. It's a great question. I'm not 100% sure of what you mean, so I'm going to, I'll answer it in two ways. The first is, in private health insurance, we're now talking about inpatients or doctors, right? So, we're not, so um, the private health insurers are not permitted to cover medical services outside of hospitals. So we're talking about inpatient services. Now, for inpatient services, it, it can be legal because the private health insurers have what are called gap cover schemes. And one of the gap cover schemes is a known gap scheme. And that is where you are allowed to bill a gap cover amount and take an extra separate transaction of usually up to $500. So that is legal. That's legal. One other thing that might help you understand it, Richard, is um, allied health. You know your extras cover when you go to the physio and you've got private health insurance and you've got extras, right? So you go to the physio. And the physio taps your health insurance card, not your Medicare card, your health insurance card, and says, okay, we've charged you $100. You've just got to give us 40 and it's gone through high caps and your health insurer is going to give us 60. That is legal. And when I explain this to allied health practitioners, I really feel for them. I think how much more complex could it get for them? Two different cards. If they are billing through the patient's private health insurance, they can charge an extra gap and it is legal. If, on the other hand, they're billing through Medicare, pursuant to a general practitioner management plan, they cannot do exactly the same thing on exactly the same high caps terminal because if they do, that is illegal, potentially fraud. So when I say that to them, I say, look, you've got to draw a line in the sand and understand Medicare public money. It, it it's got, has to have a tight regulatory framework, including fraud provisions because it's public money. It's serious. Private health insurance in extras is not public money, private policyholder money. Therefore, the law is different and therefore the way it is administered is different. So it's incredibly confusing. Imagine what it's like for poor consumers to understand. They wouldn't know. And that's part of the problem. You know, the, the consumer knowledge is so low now, very difficult for them to understand. So I hope that's answered your question, Richard. Uh, there was a note from Richard saying you answered it perfectly. So, <laughs> Yay, thank you. Um, Michael has asked, what's the most number of patients that the doctor can see per day? Uh, and he's, um, have you got Medicare? Uh, has Medicare got these numbers? Okay. So the only benchmark that, or oh, there's two now, the only sort of limit, if you like, or benchmark in the scheme is the 80-20 rule. And there's now something called the 30-20 rule, which relates to telehealth. So the 80-20 rule is that um, if a doctor, and it's, it does only apply to GPs, if a GP sees 80 or more patients on 20 days, not consecutive, just any 20 days in a 12-month period and provides certain services, they are deemed to have engaged in inappropriate practice and will be sent to the Medicare police and be in all sorts of pain and trouble. However, with the 60, and, and the same rule applies for telehealth, but the rule is capped at 30 patients to a day. But 60 or 70, what's happening, you see, is, is it's, it's not 60 patients, it's 60 services. So you could see 60 patients, but you may have provided 80 relevant services and fall foul of the 80-20 rule. So there's no um, there's no hard and fast rule about 
how many you should or shouldn't see. You should see your patients and provide good clinical care and however long it takes. One of the things I do say to practice managers, they say to me sometimes, Medicare makes us see patients every 50, 15 minutes, to which I reply, Medicare does not do that. Medicare has never done that. Medicare doesn't make you see patients at 15 minute intervals, your practice manager does. So, but this is very difficult for doctors who are sometimes pushed to see more patients than they would like to be seeing. That's a, that's a very real problem. But they're the two um, sort of benchmarks, I guess, if you like. Okay. Um, uh, Peter has asked, save as a consumer, is a Medicare complaint likely to come across a suburban solicitor's desk? For example, a magistrate's court complaint. Um, I think it's unlikely, Peter. Um, I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, mind you, I do have one at the moment. I do have one that's come across a, a suburban solicitor's desk and it's a criminal matter. It's very serious and, that, and they have reached out um, to me for some support. I would just say that I, you know, my legal practice is confined to my online MBS Answers website, so I'm not running cases anymore, but happy to support um, other lawyers who are. Um, I think it's unlikely, though, Peter, uh, to be honest. Um, what, what might happen, you might start to get consumers complaining about not getting informed financial consent. Um, there is a bit of momentum now. Um, to say, look, if, if you didn't get informed financial consent, you should not be hit with a debt from a doctor. So you might find yourself acting against a doctor on behalf of a consumer in relation to out-of-pocket costs. So that could happen too. But probably, probably not. Yeah. We probably have time just for two more questions. Um, Margaret, if we can just run through sure. those quickly. Um, Priya has asked, can a physio charge a gap for a home visit uh, if a patient is on a, man a management plan? Okay. So, again, good question, Priya. goes back to the, the whole concept of bulk billing gaps. So you've said the patient is on a management plan. So that means you're billing through Medicare. So the answer is no. You know, so what I often think is it's use of the word gap that confuses everybody. Because we just, it's in common parlance, we all use it. So people think, oh, it's a gap. But what it means is the amount of out of pocket the patient is left with after they've paid the whole amount. So, Priya, just so that I've understood, I think, I hope correctly, patients on a management plan, which is a GP management plan, you, the physio, go to the patient's home, you have to charge the full amount of money. $100 if that is your fee, and then the patient gets back whatever the rebate is. I think it might be around $80, something like that, or it might be $50, i am not sure, for physio. But your patient, what you cannot do is say to the patient, you just give me $50, I'll get the rest from Medicare. Because you see what's going to happen. Medicare is going to say, oh, that your patient didn't pay any money. Yay, bulk billing, it's all free. So you have to charge patient full amount, and the patient claims it back. Hope that answers it. All right. And um, the last question, if that's okay, Margaret, just given the time, uh, from Adrian. If a clinician were to focus on a particular practice area, they would invariably bulk bill certain numbers more often um, than others, in some inst instances, even be in the top 50 providers in the state. What are the common things that Medicare would seek to establish to assure itself that the services are being provided appropriately? Yeah. So this is another very, very good question. Thank you for it, Adrian. Um, this is really common. I see this all the time. Good clinicians doing great work, being very niche in the work that they do, not wanting to their patients to incur out-of-pocket costs, therefore choosing to bulk bill. And, of course, they get pinged by Medicare because they become a statistical outlier straight away. Because, yeah, they do more of whatever it is they're specialised in than their colleagues. 
They're doing what we want. We want them to bulk bill, but they will become a statistical outlier. And the problem with our so-called sophisticated data analytics is that it's not really that sophisticated at all. It's actually very, very blunt. Um, so, for example, you could be right in the middle of the bell curve and doing everything illegally, just billing fraudulently, just 10 fraudulent claims a day, and you'd never get caught. Whereas if you're a statistical outlier on the edges of the bell curve, you'll get caught. You might be doing a really, really great job. So the sophisticated so-called modelling is really very unsophisticated. My only tip for you is your records, records, records. Your records will save you every single time. So we often say good records, good defence, poor records, poor defence, no records, no defence. And when I talk about records, my other top tip is be very wary of templates because templates are not and, and, and are getting a lot of doctors into trouble now because the Medicare police are saying, that's oh, a template. You're just going copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. You have to particularise each entry for each patient. So records comprehensive records you've got to stand in medicare's shoes it's they're not interested in clinical care they're interested in would those it, it, have you done what the item number provide uh, wants you to do so you you've got to imagine you're a medicare auditor and you've got to read that record and think yeah that would have taken 20 minutes i reckon that would have taken 20 minutes if you write two words in status quo, which I've seen, ISQ, and then you claim a 40-minute consultation, not going to go so well. So your record keeping is critically important. All right. Thank you, Margaret. We have reached time, so we will have to end the program there. Um, I just want to thank you very much, Margaret, for coming along today. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, coming along and giving this seminar. So thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. No worries. And thank you um, to everyone who attended today. We really appreciate you also for coming along um, and attending today's seminar. Um, when we end the program, there's a very short survey which will pop up. Um, we would really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill that in. Um, we would love your feedback on today's seminar. Um, it also assists us with our program planning as well. So um, it would be great if you could fill it in. So uh, thank you again, Margaret, and thank you to everybody for coming along. Um, hope you all have a great day. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye.